All right, good morning again, everybody. It's that time to take out the Word of God. And we are going to begin with a word of prayer. And so let's quiet our hearts with God's love. Father God, we do look to you now to prepare our hearts. Lord, you've got a word for us, and it's a hard one. Lord, talking about respecting authority wherever we find it, especially in the workplace. You've got a word, you yeah. have a heart for Christian employees and how we should be behaving as representatives of you, especially in circumstances that are unpleasant and difficult in the workplace. So help us to see how these verses apply to us, to hear them, to put them into practice. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Over the years, I've had many secular jobs, and in fact, I've always worked a full-time job alongside pastoring, but as this church grew, uh, no longer was necessary or possible, and I was happy to turn my attention to pastoring full-time. But back in the 90s, uh, I was doing ministry in the inner city, and I was also wearing royal blue polyester. <clears throat> because I was proudly representing Pepsi Cola uh, merchandising there in San Francisco. Now, how about a quick survey? Because I gotta see what I'm dealing with here. Uh, if the choice is Coke or Pepsi, how many are going with Pepsi? How many are going with a Coke product? Yep, same in first service, I gotta say. And funny, the rivalry is very real. Uh, I was on break with a coworker, and I went to grab a Diet Coke in the checkout line. And he goes, dude, what are you doing? You're, you're in uniform. You can't touch that. Do you want to get fired? And I'm like, no, put it back there. So I actually enjoyed working there, but only on certain days and with certain people. We had two supervisors, and they kind of alternated. One was upbeat, reasonable, personable, more like a coach. When he was around, morale was up, and the team worked efficiently, and everything flowed smoothly. The other supervisor was negative, rude, short, abrupt, unreasonable, and when he was in charge, it was no fun for anyone. Job performances plummeted, Attitudes were bad and productivity hindered. And on top of his disagreeable uh, temper or personality, he, he, he was not a fan of the gospel. He did not care for Christians. And once he saw the Bible in the break room, uh, the snide remarks and the insults began to flow in my direction. And I remember driving to work one day, a bit bummed out, embracing for impact because he was the supervisor. And I was praying, and the Lord brought some verses to mind from the passage we're going to be looking at this morning. And as I thought about those words, I had a little bit of an epiphany, a light bulb came on, and it kind of changed my attitude. And with the change of attitude came a change in my work ethic. And uh, that brought, much to my surprise, a welcome change in Mr. Grumpy Pants, as we, <laughs> we have a little saying in our house about Mr. Grumpy Pants. And maybe I'll call him GP uh, for sure, because he does uh, come up in the text a little bit. Uh, so we are going to return where we left off in our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of 1 Peter here in chapter 2 where Peter is addressing such things as Christians in the workplace and how we should do our jobs as uh, our jobs and our behavior reflects on the Lord and either attracts unbelievers to him or hinders them from coming to faith. And so the remarks to Christian employees is made, are made in the context of the larger call of Christians to live a beautiful life in a dark, dark world. And the beautiful life needs to be morally good, above reproach, humble, and totally submissive, totally uh, subjected to the authorities, respecting authority wherever we find it, which is challenging indeed. And so... 
Yeah, and perhaps, and one of the takeaways from this before we even get started is to have a new way of thinking about your job, that it's not so much the work flowing from you uh, as much as a work God is doing in you, especially through the more difficult aspects of working a job. There's a lot of uh, discipline involved at the workplace, and God uses that to mold and shape us and form us in character and also to shine forth the outshining of this beautiful, submitted life that respects authority in the workplace and um, leads people who are in darkness uh, to consider the gospel, and lends credibility to the gospel, our message, a message that saves souls. And so, uh, yes, that's what's up this morning. And, and um, so it's really difficult to hear, but I'm going to read, and that's why I'm going to read the whole section. It's, it's really, it goes fast. It's, it's really four short paragraphs. And uh, we're going to concentrate on the remarks to the employees uh, you know, they're not called employees per se, but uh, I'll explain why there's a perfect application to our secular jobs here. So let's get the whole context of this whole beautiful life, this submitted life, this grace-filled life that we are called to live. Starting at verse 11, chapter 2, 1 Peter. Dear friends, I urge you as Foreigners, we're guests here. Our real home is in heaven. As citizens of heaven, abstain from sinful desires which war, wage war against your soul. Live such beautiful, the word is beautiful, uh, radiant lives among unbelievers that though they accuse you of doing wrong and being hateful and intolerant and, and uh, all of these things, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of the second coming there, that they might become Christians and believers so that on that day it goes well for them. Next slide. Submit yourselves, therefore, and this is what a beautiful, godly life looks like. It, it, it looks like we're not the troublemakers. We're the peaceable people. We submit ourselves for the Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake to every human authority, wherever we find it, whether to the emperor Nero at the time as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by the Lord to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good and living a beautiful, submitted, grace-filled life, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live above reproach so no one can point a finger at you for any cause. Live as free people. You've been set free from the world, but don't trash the place just because you're going to heaven and you've been set free here. Do not use your freedom as a cover-up for bad behavior and disrespectful behavior. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Oh, there's no question mark there. Sorry, that was just for humans. <laughs> Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers wherever you find them. Fear God, honor the emperor. Now to our verse. Servants, some translations have slaves. I'm going to explain the whole thing. Submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, with all respect not only to those who are good and considerate and nice and kind, but also to those who are harsh, like Mr. Grumpy Pants. <laughs> Verse 19, for it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he's conscious of God. Uh, even though they're treating you poorly, you're behaving good. This is commendable. You're enduring it well, wow. But how is it to your credit if you respond to bad behavior with bad behavior and you get punished for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good in spite of the adverse circumstances or treatment and you endure that, 
This is commendable before God. It's applaudable behavior. Now, I just want to show you next week's verse because God doesn't ask us to do anything he wasn't willing to do. And God in Christ, who is God, uh, humbled himself and lived a beautiful, submitted life, so much so that he laid down his rights, submitted himself to death on our behalf, and that's the point here. You're called to do this because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example of a beautiful, good, gracious, submitted life. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth, even though he didn't answer back when they hurled their insults at him. He still lived a beautiful life. He did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats because he was good and grace-filled and submitted to the Father's will. Instead, he entrusted himself to God the Father, who judges justly, he's got it all figured out, it's in his hands. He bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to our sins and live the right way by God. By his wounds you have been healed, for you are like sheep. You were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. That's the context now. Uh, We're going to isolate those words uh, for employees, as we're calling them, that. So let's get situated, and then we'll go to work, pun intended. Uh, some of you heard it there. Thank you. Um, I do want to concentrate on the verses, though there's only three of them, but it, there's springboard to so many other New Testament passages that talk about the same idea only expanded. So there's plenty of material uh, to cover. And uh, it's so important because most of our lives are in the workplace. And here's the first takeaway is, is that we know we will stand before God as believers and be judged, a judgment that uh, either gives us reward or debits the reward. We still end up in heaven. But here's my takeaway. Most of what we will be evaluated for is job-related. Where did you spend most of your life? Pretty much a big chunk of your life was work-related. And so what are we going to be talking about with him? Our work. People forget that. They just see, you know, I just, it's a, it's a necessary evil. I go to work and I, I got to make a living somehow. And so we have this little compartment called my secular job. And we go in, punch the clock, and we go out, but we forget. We're on the clock. And God has sent us to that job, as we're going to see. And so it's just important. So I just throw that out there to just kind of stir us up to realize, I don't know about you, but I have written down here every single time I read this paragraph that we're going to be looking at. Now, you can throw it up there just so it can marinate in us. Every time I read it, it feels like the first time. And it feels like, oh, my goodness, I, I don't naturally think this way, you know, about secular employment. It just, it's just this thing that we got to get over. So the overarching theme of the context here, respecting authority structures wherever we find it. So he's, if you haven't noticed, he's going down the arenas where you find authority. And there's not one square inch of this planet that doesn't have someone in charge. That's the way God designed life to be. That's what, how he ordered it. In fact, if we uh, revisit Romans 13, and I'll quote it for you. I'm quoting the Bible let everyone be subject to governing authorities. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels, resists against the authority, is resisting and rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring trouble upon themselves. Romans 13, verses uh, 1 and 2. So, have you noticed that he's saying we need to, to a beautiful life is submitted and respects authority wherever you find it, whether it's an ideal citizen who respects civil authority. And now, that was last week. And now, whether you're respecting authority in the workplace, that's this week. As hardworking ideal employees, 
no matter your circumstances. Circumstances irrelevant to your behavior, which is good and submitted always. Uh, three, um, or, or where you find authority flowing in the home. Next up will be husbands and wives and children and parents. And then next after that will be in the church, the congregation. And as I said, there's not a square inch on the planet, in heaven and on earth, where somebody is not responsible for order and uh, that we answer to uh, if there's a problem or how life should be working in that sphere, you see. And so, and just when we think it's unreasonable what God is asking, or we have a lot of pushback, uh, he throws up the example of Jesus, who lived a, a humble, submitted, respecting, authority kind of life uh, on our behalf. And so we get to that next week, and it'll be perfect for communion. And so before we dive in here, I've got to get this obligatory exception clause out of the way to settle you all down, because uh, as rebels at heart, all human beings were born rebels, and that we still retain that a little bit of that, uh, even as Christians. And so uh, I know that all of us uh, get our feathers ruffled when we read these kinds of things, and we're always, well, what if, and what if that, and what if this? So to settle you down, as I said last time we were in here, and that God has never expects a Christian to obey an order that violates his commands or uh, causes you to break the law or do something evil. So let's just get that out of the way. It shouldn't even have to be said. It's kind of common sense, but we say it because we have a lot of what about this kind of thing. Uh, generally speaking, God has uh, created society and the world with uh, authority that flows from him, and that structure, wherever you find it, needs to be respected, with the one exception of forcing you to sin against the Lord. And so now that we got that 0.01% out of the way, see? You didn't like hearing that, I could tell. Uh, we'll, we'll go on, because you were like, Pastor Ross, it's a lot more than 0.01. Okay, it's a point. 0.1%, okay, or 99%. Okay, send your emails to Pastor Ben at cctherock.org. <laughs> okay, let's get to work figuratively and uh, kind of literally here. Now, let's start with definition of terms. Uh, okay, so just when you think, you know, the exhortation to work diligently with a good attitude for an obnoxious manager is hard enough. I mean, who wants to do that? Answer, no one. Uh, on top of that, the term here used, uh, slaves and masters, quite unhelpful as they get us thinking about the horrible degradation uh, 19th uh, century pre-Civil War America. Very different from what's going on here in the first century uh, Roman Empire. It was said that up to a half of the Roman Empire were employed as indentured servants. The word indentured means contracted. Um, 60 million of them uh, in that day. Now, as you would imagine, many of these, uh, that first word, servants, verse 18, were laborers, housekeepers, au pairs, uh, landscapers. In fact, the word does not mean slave. There, it's not the usual word for slave. You can put the word there, uh, but actually it's from the word oikos, a uh, house in Greek. So it's the household, it's the domestics. He's really singling out because the domestics had the hardest time. Because why? If you're stuck with Mr. Grumpy Pants in the house and you're in the house, then your work is even harder if he is an adverse kind of character. Uh, so he's talking to the domestics, though the servant word there includes, and this may surprise you, skilled professionals, uh, teachers, physicians, lawyers, musicians, and artisans, craftsmen. Um, and they were contracted. Uh, uh, for their services, and they became 
servants, and they had a boss or a master. And so just saying for all of our detractors out there and um, unbelieving critics that say the Bible condones slavery, that's wrong. Uh, the gospel comes into the world, and Christ came into the world not to overthrow institutions, but to save sinners. So the gospel changes the world by changing men's hearts. He didn't come to overthrow institutions. He came to overthrow the sin in our hearts. And truth be told, the reason we no longer have the ugly chattel form of slavery, as it's called, is because thanks to the gospel. It's the gospel at work in the hearts and the communities of our forefathers that came to the front and liberated us from that nasty, nasty uh, time. And so that out of the way, um, those who were contracted, um, they had agreed upon terms for job description, the, the period of time, the terms for payment. And writers say that, for the most part, servants were treated well, for the most part. Uh, though once you signed, you had very limited options, and so you were low in status. There was nothing really you could do if you wound up serving a, a, an obnoxious uh, boss, if we can call him that. And so um, because of this, uh, it really makes a solid application uh, for secular employment today. There's a lot of uh, ways it's relatable. And so, yeah, when it was good, they had lifelong employment and lifelong friends. And when it was bad, it was miserable. So let's first turn our attention, if you're taking notes, uh, to the problem at hand. And the problem happens to be a person, a boss, an overseer, a manager, a supervisor who is harsh and demanding and makes compliance difficult. Uh, that's verse 18. So the word there for harsh is an interesting one. In the Greek, it's skolios, where we get the word skoliosis, which means bent out of shape. Bent out of shape. And he's crooked, but not so much dishonest, though it would include being slippery and slimy. Um, it is it's really pointing to someone who's unfair, who's rude and disagreeable and lacking character and just wants the money. Get the job done. You know, that kind of guy. The kind of man the world might call a jerk, you see. And so we're exhorted here to treat the distasteful person who's over us with respect. Now, let me help you once again when the Lord says, respect everyone, we get tripped up because we hear that as, I really respect my dad. He's a man of this uh, valor, and he's got all of these virtues. It's not the same way of thinking of respect. It's being respectful of the person by not disrespecting them. In other words, by their bad behavior, uh, you would not slander them or disrespect them by becoming insolent or insubordinate in this case. And so the way you respect a, an un, uh, a, the way you respect somebody who's not, um, not uh, treating you well is by being compliant and polite despite his terrible behavior. All right. So do you see what I'm saying? I'm saying you respect somebody regardless of, of how they're behaving, right? Because Christians never have a pass to act badly. You just never get to say, well, because they aggress me, I aggress them back. No, no, you're not allowed to do that because that's how the world responds. We have a different spirit in us if you've been raised to a new life. And so because in God's economy, respectable behavior is not reserved for respectable people alone. It makes it easier to respect them, uh, but we respect them nonetheless. First uh, Peter 2 and 17 says, show your proper respect to everyone. Because the, at the end of the day, every single human being has God's stamp of image upon them. We respect them with common dignities 
and courtesies, and, 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 and they are, at the end of the day, Mr. Grumpy Pants included, and the ones that you don't like, the people you don't like, is someone for whom Christ died. And for that reason and that reason alone, you shall respect them by not disrespecting them, um, mistreating them, insulting them, slandering them, mocking them. All of that's out uh, the door there. Yeah, you can speak the truth in love, but, you know, you're, we're very limited. I mean, what, what can we do with an enemy? Well, you can cook them dinner, you know, if they're hungry. And, you know, that just got a response out of you, like, who wants to do that? <laughs> like, I don't like hearing this because you're telling me to, to take an enemy out when, I, you know, I want to take them out. <laughs> but not to dinner, <laughs> not to dinner. <laughs> All right, so... What the hard part here, note takers, is the manual override that's required, which is most of your Christian life. Haven't you figured that out? I have. Is, is that mostly uh, what God requires is not my natural inclination. So I call it putting in manual overdrive that by the spirit, I have to go into the spirit and the word, and I have to pray uh, because I'm, now I need the new life for his new commands. And so he says, submit and comply with all respect. The word there is fear, the respect word. He says, subject yourselves with all fear. It's the same word to fear God with. And, and what is he saying? Well, have some reverence for the one who's over you, simply, number one, because they're over you and can make your life harder and more Difficult. So there's an understanding of have some common sense with self-preservation to understand that you don't poke the guy in the eye when he's the one with the power, you see? And so the Proverbs, I love that uh, it's to the extreme, but the concepts here in Proverbs 16 and verse 14, the anger of the king is a deadly threat. The wise will try to appease it. When a king's face brightens, it means life. His favor is like a rain cloud in the spring. And so the scriptures will say, comply for your own sake. You may need your paycheck. You, <laughs> you may want your benefits. And in a digital age, my friend, a bad review of your behavior at the workplace can tag you and follow you all the days of your life, and you will dwell in the unemployment line forever. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, so. Not to mention getting on someone's bad side uh, that has influence over you isn't going to improve the quality of your work week at all. So uh, the challenge now to comply uh, with somebody you, uh, or at a place you feel disinterested or bored or bothered or you'd rather be somewhere else. This is the kind of thing God is talking about. And let me say this. Today's society has not helped Christians in this regard because you can say what you will, but at the end of the day, the way the world thinks can seep into our thinking as well. And we have this when we bristle with this whole idea of submitting to authority. It's because the world has gotten a hold of us a little bit. You see? None of us are free from the influence of ungodly thinking. And ungodly thinking today is produced and almost deifies the individual and the individual's rights uh, to the point where now a disgruntled employee with a perceived slight offense can just uh, leave, walk off the job, uh, leave everybody hanging. There's this sense of entitlement, and um, yeah, they can feel slighted or like, how dare you criticize me for talking too much and not working hard enough? The nerve, you know? And so they need to get to a safe space, you know? And they, <laughs> come on. It's Sunday. Have a little fun. Because they were criticized, you know. We were at Mojo's Froyo, whatever it's called out there. I'm not even going to mention it. Uh, we walk in, two girls on their phones. 
Nobody else is in there for good reason, probably. Uh, and, and so I'm standing there. They're on their phones. They see me. They're on their phones. And so I go, <clears throat> <laughs> and they look at me like, oh, a customer. <laughs> I was like in the middle of texting my friend, OK? You know, sorry, that's my teenage girl yogurt shop voice. <laughs> and so we get ordered, and they never put their phones down the whole time we were in there. And I whispered to Barb, I'm telling on them. <laughs> I'm going to find the owner, and I'm going to take a picture, and I'm going to, and Barb goes, and she always has to do this. <laughs> she says, no, you're not. <laughs> Because you're, you're not the secret police, you know? And so I was just like, oh, unbelievable. And then, you know, they'll get fired for that, right? And, you know, they'll go on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook and tell the whole world how they were abused and let go and thrust out into the cold, dark world. And, you know, they'll spin it and put it all on the employer and uh, tear them to shreds and all of that. And then... They'll start a GoFundMe page <laughs> because they can no longer work because of the PTSD, all right? <laughs> so this kind of thinking has gotten a hold of us, and it's inside of us, too. And so, yeah, and, and now the big difference between us and them is they don't have the options you have when you don't like your job and you just want out. Listen, you can get out but you must do it in the godliest with fear and trembling, lest you offend the true boss who's watching you and has sent you there as his representative. That's his thinking, that he got you the job, that he put you there, not just for the paycheck, but to shine for him and to do some work in your own heart and life. The work, the reformers called work a holy convocation, a holy sacred calling that we do our work as unto the Lord based on these passages. And we'll take a good look at that. And so they didn't have the options that we have in it. And, in, and that works to our advantage because we get to hear God's heart on if we're stuck in a job, and some of, some of you might be or have been stuck in a job that's kind of miserable and very difficult, you see, how God still expects you to behave. And so, yeah, when Christians are employed by unsavory people and, who work in, and those of us who work in unsavory circumstances, uh, here's some help with the thinking. And the thinking is uh, we are here... <laughs> first and foremost, to represent Christ. And it may rub us the wrong way to respond in an opposite spirit, uh, but it's right up God's alley. That's how he is. He loves the unlovable. He loves his enemies. He's kind to the ungrateful. I'm quoting the Bible. He forgives those who sin against him. Do you? Do I? He extends mercy to the guilty. And he expects us to extend mercy to people. And the word mercy means doesn't deserve it. He works on behalf of those who are contrary to him. How about us? And so that's exactly what he's doing. And where else would he teach you how to bless those who curse you? He expects us to bless those who curse us and to pray for those who persecute us. Well, where are we going to learn all of that? At work, in our marriages, in hard places. And so we should expect that uh, the arena where God put you is to refine you and to shine through you and all of this good stuff. And if you're born of the Spirit of God, he expects us to be like our Father, and that's how he is. But human nature is we love who love us. Uh, we, we're nice to those who are nice to us. We work hard when we're feeling appreciated. And, and when we're not, you know what? And this is what Jesus says. Really, guys, is that all I can get out of you? I, you know, I can get that out of an atheist. I really can. Because atheists can work hard 
when everyone's applauding them and making life easy at the job site. I can get that from an unbeliever. But what I was hoping I might be able to get you who've been raised to a new life and powered by the divine nature in there, I was just hoping maybe you could just do something a little bit above that by responding with compliance and humility when aggressed. To answer a strong, angry word softly so that you might turn away the wrath. Because he says, in the world, when they're aggressed, they aggress. When they're slapped, they slap back. When they're disrespected, they disrespect. When they're bored, they pull out their phones. When it's too hard to do it the right way, they do it the wrong way. Who cares? It's just work. It's just a paycheck. I'm not invested here. That's the world's way of thinking. And the problem is, is that Christians often feel like my real life starts at 501. Because it's certainly not at Chick-fil-A or Keyside. My real life is outside of that. And the Lord is like, your real life is wherever you are. Because you're on the clock with me. 24 7 as a servant of the Lord, whether that's at the gym or you're on vacation or you're in your house or you're in church or you're at your job where I put you. I put you there. You think it happened this, that, that, that and then she called her and I, and I, yeah, and the Lord's like, oh yeah, it was all on you. <laughs> Nothing's all on us. The righteous footsteps are ordered of the Lord. He put you there to serve him. The person in front of you regarding your behavior is irrelevant, as we're going to see here. Now, he says, look, if you answer ba back their bad behavior with bad behavior, what, how is that commendable, right? So he says it's commendable if you put up with things and are, you're compliant and sweet and, and humble and keep a tight rein on your tongue and all of that when you are enduring conscious of God. You're saying, Lord, this is unpleasant, but I'm thinking, God, God, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for you, God. And the Lord, it says, commendable, applause-worthy. You're going to hear about it. God says, I will reward you down to the cup of cold water you gave out in my name, which really means a compliment, a prayer, something that lifted somebody up, a cool refreshment, down to something that you forgot long ago. I'm going to bring it up and reward you in a tangible way in heaven. How much more so your job when he changes his mind a thousand times, and when you do something, all he sees is the negative thing and the, the 10 beautiful things you did. He missed that, but he gets the one little thing, you know, and you're still okay with working diligently and dedicated and hardworking, and you keep your mouth from evil. Then God says, that's my boy. That's my girl. Right there. And you're going to, and I'm going to hear about it. I told somebody before the service that I wish I would have paid attention to this when I worked all my life, all my life up to 10 years ago. I had secular employment. And now, as I'm preaching this to you, I'm like, oh, man. Oh, there's a lot of missed opportunities to respond with beautiful uh, love and patience uh, when uh, it wasn't called for in the world's way of understanding that. So he, here's the deal. God isn't impressed when we respond to bad behavior with more bad behavior, but he, he wants us to do, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So when he's unkind, you're kind. When she's rude, you're polite. Uh, when He's rude and demanding, you're sweetly compliant. And, and when she's demoralizing, you are diligently working hard. It's a new way of thinking. Uh, and uh, how on earth is this possible to be like this? Well, here's a very helpful 
attitude adjustment that uh, is very, uh, and, and, and an insight that will make all the difference in the world. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5 through 8. Servants, employees, obey your earthly bosses with respect and fear. What? Just my boss at Chick-fil-A with fear <laughs> and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey Christ. Are you kidding me? I could read that 100 times here, and by around 95 times, it would begin to sink in. But that's how many times it would take for me to really, truly understand and believe that God really wants me to treat the supervisor at McDonald's as I would treat him I'm just, I'm almost speechless trying to really wrap my mind around that. Obey them, not only to win their favor, do, do just the fake thing, the surface thing, when they're watching you or you in front of the cameras, you know, but as slaves of Christ first, you're his employee first, doing the will of God from your heart. There it is the second time from your heart. You're in it. For real, sincerely, you're not forcing anything. You're like, this is my place, this is my ministry, this is where God put me. And I'm looking at his face, but I'm seeing the face of my Lord. That is a very rare occurrence. And if you're one of the rare gems that God has, when you're able to do this, you will make bank in heaven. You will make bank in heaven. Obey them not only when they're watching you doing the will of God from your heart. Third time, heart, wholeheartedly, all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. As if you were serving the Lord, not people. What are you talking about? I'm at Oliver's, and you're saying serve wholeheartedly with passion and dedication and sacrifice as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Get the people out of the picture because you know that the Lord will reward you. He's got the paycheck that matters. Whether you are slave or free, employed or not, you're on the clock and how you live matters, especially when it's uh, adverse. That's the big thing here. So obey your boss as you would obey Jesus. Uh, this is incredible, and it will help a lot because you just get the picture, the person out of the way. Because you can say whatever you want about however it is you are working or whatever. Let's just say whatever situation outside of working. Outside of working, because you're still a slave to God. You're, you're employed outside of the actual job site. So let's just, just say that so, somebody's giving you a hard time. You don't respond to the person. You respond to God as God would have you respond. This will change everything. So the wrong attitude is just seeing it as I'm there to serve up the food and change uh, or uh, hang some sheetrock, you know, or, or fix the pipes or whatever, you know, I, and, but not with the heart in it. Now, somebody said something to me about the heart, and it reminds me, I'll tell you the story, it's in a small shop in town owned by a Christian. We're chatting away, I saw a help wanted sign behind his head, so I said, hey, I'm a pastor, um, I could send the word out there, I could pass the word along, but you need some help. And he goes, uh, well, um, well, uh, yeah, uh, no, you don't need to do that. He goes, I, I haven't had too much luck with Christians. I, their heart's not in it. You know, to me, this is my life. It was my dad's life. It's generational. It's family. Yeah, I know it's only, and I'm going to leave it blank, it's only the product. And then he said the product because I don't want to put him on blast uh, because you probably know him. I know you guys. You know everybody, you know, <laughs> some of you. So he said, I know to some it's only cups, but to us, and when I get a Christian in here, I don't know where they're at. They just don't take it seriously. And then they find out that I'm a brother in the Lord, and they take advantage of me. 
they're like, yo, bro, I was at, you know, I tell, oh, where were you? Uh, well, I took a long lunch because I got into a conversation leading somebody to the Lord. It's like, oh, that's nice, you know, and all of this stuff. And so, yeah, you're quiet here because the Lord is doing his work, isn't he? <laughs> Yeah, so not much reward for that kind of uh, behavior. I do have something from 1 Timothy chapter 6 I'll read to you. All who are under the yoke of employment should consider their bosses worthy of full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered, you see? How you behave at work gives unbelievers an excuse that they've been looking for. <laughs> Christian, look how he lives. And then they think they can disregard the entire message based on your job performance. So Paul says, don't do that. Those who have believing masters should not show them disrespect just because they're fellow believers. Look at that right there. He knows how we are. Oh, you're a brother. So you know you have to show me grace. Instead, they should serve them even harder and more diligently because their masters are dear to them as believers, and those masters are devoted to the welfare of those who serve. So back to Ephesians 6 here. Really, from heaven's point of view, you, you and I are working for God and his son, the family business, and he sends you in to that business as a representative of his. Now, I want you to imagine that uh, he's, let's, let's say that the Lord has sent uh, John uh, to Whole Foods uh, to work a job there. And you know what? I'm tired of picking on John. Let's go with Mike, all right? <laughs> so, and now I just saw Mike. So let's just go with Dave. No, I can't do Dave. Let's go with Bartholomew, all right? So Bartholomew, <laughs> don't come up to me afterwards and say, I'm Bartholomew. Yeah. So he gets a job, but Bart arrives late. He's wearing clothes that look like he just grabbed them out of the pile on his floor. And he looks like he got out of bed 15 minutes ago. And he's there. And God sent him there. God sent him there. He's his boy. The manager tells uh, Bart what he needs to done. And Bart's first response is to tell him all the reasons why it won't work. And then all the reasons why he's got the better idea. So after John is strong-armed, John, sorry, after uh, Bart is strong-armed into doing what the boss hired him to do, uh, afterwards it's discovered that he did it uh, halfway incorrectly and incompletely. Uh, he came in late, he left early, he took a two-hour lunch. When he returns to the floor, he talks all about his hobby of collecting rare coins uh, for 35 minutes. And, you know, if the Lord called the manager and said, what did you think of my boy? The manager would say, please don't send me any of, of other children of yours, <laughs> right? So how embarrassing, but I think the Lord has to deal with this on a daily basis because there's something about being freed from this world that we feel uh, uh, in an incentive to disrespect the place. Look, I got a boss in heaven. I can't, I'm going to heaven and all of this stuff, but nothing could be further from the truth. And so notice it's uh, with all your heart three times in the passage there in verse 5, in verse 6, and verse 9. Serve God with all your heart, not for the paycheck alone, not watching the clock uh, like I can't wait to get out of here. But uh, because when the heart is missing, uh, in action, it's all sort of this, you know, if your heart's not in your work, it's sort of like, you know, it, it doesn't matter how I sort the dumb mail or load the dumb truck or fix the dumb brakes or take the dumb order or enter the dumb data or trim these dumb trees or fix this dumb car or deal with these dumb people because your heart's not there. On the contrary, it matters it all matters to God. And the only one acting dumb is you, right? Because you're fixing the car for Christ. At least 
That's what God thinks. God thinks you're at the job working for him. That's his, he's under that impression. And he's trying to, to convince us to believe that he's actually behind the scenes of it all and wanting you to perform uh, to his standards. And I, I, I think you're getting it now. Now, I'll, I'll close out with this little story. And back to Mr. Grumpy Pants, actually, um, my supervisor at Pepsi. He was making my life miserable. And often, I would just be thinking, I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to quit. But I, I, I would just... I liked the job when it wasn't uh, around him. And so one day I walked into a receiving room at like Safeway 750 downtown or wherever it was. And I walk into this big receiving dock. And the uh, big manager of the store was so upset and hollering and fiercely with this huge tirade yelling at Mr. Grumpy Pen. So I walk in there. He had made a ginormous error that caused a lot of problems. And so I walked in there. My flesh was having a party. My flesh was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I tried to just not show my happiness, right? So I'm standing there, and he's getting slammed. And I'm just there, and he sees me watching him. And what a look on his face, but nothing like when we got back to headquarters, the big boss at Pepsi was talking to him about his day, and I was in the sphere. And he looked at me, Mr. Grumpy Pants looks at me like, I beg you. He looked at me, his face said it all, have mercy on me. Like, don't, please don't, you know? And I communicated to him, I got you. With a smile, I got you. And because the big boss was looking at me in my direction, I could have said anything. I got you. And I walked by him, I got you. We became friends because of that. It changed everything. It changed everything. And here's the deal. When, when we dare, when we dare to take the tiniest step toward godliness, to doing it against our natural inclination with every cell in my body saying, get them. <laughs> oh, now I got to Thank you, Jesus. You turn the tables. <laughs> Boom, it's my turn, you know. With, though you, you die to that and you're prayerfully calling on God for his help and you're like, now's the moment. I got you. And it turns the tide. It makes you want to do it more. Often. So trust me, as you all know, this is all true, but it's good to be reminded. It works. If you do it, there's a cost, but there are big benefits there. So just remember in the back of your mind, it won't be for naught. That's the lie, is that uh, there'll be winning and you're just a doormat and blah, no, 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 no. Do it God's way, and I promise you big returns. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your word, <laughs> this hard word, God. Uh, Lord, you've got your spirit in us, and we pray that you would help us to apply these truths. They're difficult, Lord. Make us want to do these things. Show us the truth and the worthiness of stepping outside of our comfort zone and doing the will of God by your power. And for your sake, in Jesus' name, amen.